Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to my Molotov seminar. My name is Jake Roussel. Uh, I am here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, issues related to blindness and maybe some of the misconceptions that people have about people with well, disabilities in general. Um, so let me start by asking you this first. When you hear about someone that has a disability, what do you kind of think about? Do you think of them as capable? Do you think of them as like, they might stay in their home and need to be done for them? Like, what are your kind of perceptions? Anybody? I think that's, uh, for me, that's, uh, that's too general. It, it would depend on what disability it is. Well, the problem is with that, that's a good answer, but a lot of people really think that people that are disabled, that disabilities, really don't do anything. They think that they uh, basically, they're homebound or they always have helpers or they have everything done for them. Uh, like, I remember, for, or they, or they just, they almost never succeed in life or go anywhere. Uh, I, remember, I remember one night I was downtown and somebody handed me five bucks and said, you need this. And I was like, what? Really? <laughs> and at first I didn't know how to take it. I was kind of like, thanks. And then he was gone. So then I couldn't even give it back or say, no, this is stupid, you know? Because it was very, well, it's very uh, condescending, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I didn't need his money for anything. I, I, I make my own money. I work, you know, I do what I do. I, I, I get up every day, I go to work, I make my own food. I use help for some things, like I don't like grocery shopping. You know, I might use a friend for that, but even now we have so many things like curbside delivery, pickup, or, you know, delivery services that you can do it on your own too, you know? So that's kind of a lot of things that people kind of think about. They think that uh, people with disabilities can't function on their own. Um, where is really a matter of a matter of it is just kind of modern, you know, technology and conveniences, or just finding a way to do something. Um, is it an adjustment period? Of course. No, not everything comes easy. Uh, I mean, I can do a lot of the same things that you do, except drive a car. But but it just takes a little kind of, you know, uh, strategizing, thinking of new ways to do things. You know. So. Uh, but then there's people out there that think that people that are, you know, that do leave their houses to, well, walk down the street by themselves or roll down the street in their wheelchairs or, you know, cross that street by themselves with their cane, they think they're amazing people. Do you think that? It's just normal day to day. Right, exactly. It's normal day to day. Uh, what I do when I, when I talk to people about stuff like that, these things, it's not to, I'm not here to be an inspiration per se, but I'm here to make awareness of stuff. If you get inspired by something that I do, that's great. But every day I, I have to get up and I have to go live my life. If I don't, well then, I, it's, I'm nothing. Um, I have to take care of myself. There's no one to do it for me. So a little bit of background. Uh, I was born in San Antonio uh, to my parents, Danny and Beverly. They're great people. My dad was in the military for 24 years, mom worked for the government for a long time, about 37 years. And because he was in the military, you know, we moved We moved to Germany when I was about three or four years old, which was a whole weird system. Uh, schools there didn't really understand how to deal with people with disabilities. Uh, a lot of times it was a thing where you would go to a special school. But there was nothing intellectually wrong with me, I could think, I could process you know, thoughts and ideas. So it was like, why go to a special school? Uh, so my mother and father pushed very hard to keep me into the mainstream, you know, the mainstream education system, which took a long time. It took a lot of proving things that I could do, uh, that I could sit in a classroom and answer questions and, and find ways to gather information and do assignments. Uh, so when I actually was finally able to be in the normal classroom setting, I was given services through the, you know, a lot of the, the systems that they actually had in place, uh, their commissions and uh, disability services. I was given like an, an aide in elementary school, a, a classroom aide to help me out. She, she was a great lady. Um, help me with my assignments or help me at least read things or transcribe things into, into Braille or whatever I needed. Uh, at the time, they didn't have a lot of books on, you know, on audio formats. So textbooks were really, really big. They came in volumes of Braille, Braille volumes that were like, and they came in boxes. They were so huge. Um, you think your print books could have you in your bag sometimes? Or they do? They did at some point? Well, try these. You, you can't possibly carry around a whole box of books. 
So you have to kind of find the volume that actually pertain to the chapter you were doing and carry that around. And it got heavy. Imagine like five or six subjects and you carry all the books in your backpack. Some people will have like, that are blind will have backpacks like this kind of slumped over because they had such heavy backpacks as children that, you know, it kind of can mess you up a little bit. So are these Braille books like regular books except that the pages are made out of some like stiffer material or like what are the books like? Stiffer paper, yeah, stiffer paper that can actually be brailled on because the braille has to be able to kind of, the paper has to be able to actually hold the braille. So you can't use really, you can use regular paper per se, but it's just not, it's going to tear or it's going to just not, it's be too flimsy for the braille. The braille will get soft and wear off. So it's stiffer paper and the paper is a lot larger. Uh, and you can't really you can't really shrink braille either. Whereas we can play with fonts all day on the computer, you can't really change the font, you can't really shrink braille, so it kind of is what it is. So nowadays you don't really see a lot of braille textbooks anymore because a lot of books now you, you still do, but it's not as common. A lot of books now can be found in audio and uh, in audio text sources, which so is great. Were you able to find or were they able to find braille textbooks? which are the same textbooks as what your classmates yes. were reading? Yes, yep. It's, it was the same exact book, just printed into Braille. Sometimes it had to be like where a company would have to make them, but it was the same exact book. Uh, so figures in the books they would like describe, it would be like, figure eight is blah blah blah, you know, um, man sitting on couch, you know, something like that. That's what they would do. Um, so that's what they would do with that. Which all, of course, of course, you know, will take even more space sometimes describing the figures itself. But yeah, it was the same exact book. Uh, you even have like all the index, the contents, all the glossaries, all that stuff would be there, whatever you would need. I have more questions. Okay. So I noticed that, I mean, you have limited vision. Right. And I've seen you kind of like looking at your phone, like reading stuff. Uh -huh. Did you have that ability when you were in Germany, like look closely at a book and read something? It would cause a lot of strain. Um, there was a thing called, there's a thing called a CCTV, closed circuit television, where you can put things under it and it will magnify. You know, it's under a TV screen kind of, and there's a camera mm -hmm. that makes things larger for you. So you can listen, you can read uh, books that way. Um, <clears throat> in later times, they came out with scanners. You can actually scan books and, you know, put them into larger, like, you know, more digital formats or, you know, whatnot. Or if there was some kind of speech program, you could read it that way too, which has come a long way since its first, you know, inception a long time ago. So are you straining your eyes every time you're using your phone to read? No, um, <clears throat> my phone, see, the beauty of the iPhone is that it has a voiceover. Once they started making the three, they put a voiceover uh, system in the settings mode, accessibility area. So the phone will talk. Whatever you push, like, so I have to kind of double tap everything. So um, friends that try to use my phone, they love it. They get so annoyed because it just <laughs> messes them up so bad. They're like, what is wrong with your phone? And I just sit there and laugh a little bit, you know? But uh, yeah, so you have to kind of double tap everything because it's, it's, what it's doing is letting you recognize what you're pushing before you actually send it, you know? So that's the beauty of that. Um, some things I'll look at kind of, but it's, it's really great that this feature is available because I used to have a really hard time texting before that was available. Texting was so hard. <laughs> so, you know. Um, thank you, Apple, <laughs> for that. Um, thank you, other app companies, for what you've done to make voiceover available on your other phones. I appreciate you so much. So does the blind community. Um, so yeah, when I was in school, we didn't have any of that stuff. We had like, I don't even think we had JAWS yet. JAWS is a speech program for the computer. You guys heard of that at all? JAWS? JAWS, okay, so JAWS is a program that will basically read what's on the screen to you under in your computer. Uh, you can push certain keystrokes and certain commands, and it will tell you what's, what's going on. Um, it's a whole new way of learning. <laughs> it's, it's, I've known JAWS at some points, but I've forgotten a lot of it, because I don't, I don't really use it much myself. But, uh, I'll use a program called Zoom Text, so that enlarges, that magnifies everything on the screen too, which I kind of prefer. Um, I feel like I can just, I can move a little faster for myself. So, uh, I remember I used to have laptops in, in school that would talk. They had like some minimal speech programs that were on there. Uh, I don't know what they were called. They were just whatever was built in, you know. And so I, I was able to do assignments and whatnot and get stuff done that way, but. There again, of course, it was challenging sometimes to learn the systems and the programs. Um, when I got into college, though, uh, I wound up going to school. I went to school at ACC for a while, for a couple of years, got my associates in uh, mass communications. Then I uh, went to Texas State, where I got my undergrad, a double major in English and journalism. And now I've since gotten my master's in adult education. 
from uh, Texas State. Um, in college, it was a lot harder to find books in Braille. That wasn't that was basically be a thing where like you would have to scan it and run it through an embosser system, which is called an embosser is a giant printer that can actually produce Braille documents for you. It's massive. It runs through a program called Duxbury, uh, so you have to do like, a lot of commands and conversions of documents to make them Braille friendly. How many of those printers are around? There's quite a few. Um, they're a lot more common now. They're still pretty expensive, but. But they're, they're around. Uh, like I know we have several in our, at our school. I work at the Texas School of the Blind. We have several there. Chris Cole Rehabilitation Center has them. Um, they're findable. You can find them. So, so uh, in Braille, uh, every, uh, let's say, does Braille only come for English or? No. Okay. There are other things too. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the typical like kind of structure of Braille stays the same, but there's a lot of different like accent marks or you know so there's there's ways to kind of change change it up a little. But there's a, the, the Braille symbols ha are one to one with the English alphabet. Well, I'll, I'll get to that part. Um, okay. I have something about that already for you. So okay. we'll wait on that. But but yeah, so that was it. So basically, a lot of times what I would do with books in college, I would get a lot of I'd find audio files. Uh, you can write to publishers. Sometimes they'll send you uh, Word or PDF files of the books. You have to kind of show that you bought the book, the print version, which is weird to me, but okay. But I'm like, you know, can I just buy the digital parts? <laughs> that would be great. Um, so uh, that's how I did a lot of my book reading. Um, and I just use my computer to read. Assignments, the same thing. P teachers would like, would like email me assignments or documents or handouts. That just made it easier, you know. Or they'd use the Braille Buster sometimes. Sometimes I did get handouts in Braille. Because they were easier to, they were easier to do. They weren't whole books, you know. So do that kind of thing. So the question that I was trying to get at, this is something that I'm curious about. Okay. If 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 the Braille symbols uh, just correspond to letters in the English alphabet, you could imagine Braille as just being a different font. And so if you mm -hmm. change the font and then, then print using that font, is that what the Braille Embossard does? Uh, so it converts it into the Braille format. Because the Braille, okay, I'll get into it a little bit. The Braille is, all Braille is comprised of six dots. So it, it's not quite, you, you're not feeling the same letters at all in, you know, in Braille that you're, that you're looking at in print. They don't look the same at all. Yeah. So that's what happens with that. Um, that's why you have to convert it uh, to get all the right, well, you gotta kind of clean up some of like the spacings, the lines, some of the symbols. There's a few things you gotta clean up. You gotta format it to the paper, you know, that kind of stuff. Because Braille paper is different from, you know, of course, legal paper that we have. So you have to do a lot of formatting too, through the Duxbury process. But it's not like learning a whole new language. I wouldn't say that. People, people, some people would say that it is, but I don't think so necessarily. I mean, I guess in some ways it could be, but there again, it's like, depends on what you want to do with it too. Do um, you want to become fully fluent in it, or do you want to learn like just the functional type Braille, you know? Functional Braille is like where you, people would use it just to kind of label something or if you're walking along, along like, you know, in, in the hallway, are the room numbers Braille here in the hallway? I don't think that the room numbers are Our room is kind of old. Okay. But the bathrooms probably are, right? The bathroom uh, signs? The elevators are. The elevators are? Elevators okay, are yeah. Okay, so things like that. You know, you'll find them, that's, that's, that's more like functional use. Um, everyday type of use. People might label things at home, like their stove. Uh, I cook for myself. I, I, I mark my stove, not in Braille, but I mark certain parts of the stove so I know what's what I'm turning my knob to, you know? When I'm setting the oven, I don't want to burn my house down. I really don't. <laughs> so I want to know where 400 is, you know? So I'm going to mark that on my oven. So when I'm turning it, I know what I'm getting. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Uh, since we're on the education side. Yeah. Up to this point, uh, growing up from Germany all the way to college, uh, how much pushback would you say you received as far as whether it be institutional, like the educators themselves, or uh, just the process of being able to have tools to accommodate, uh, such as everything that you just described. How, where on the difficulty scale or the pushback scale would you say individuals or uh, processes would be um, um, from then to now? As a, okay, so <clears throat> back then it was definitely more difficult. Back in the Germany days, it was a lot harder because a lot of things weren't even as available. So that, it was more about that too, or things were so expensive to get a hold of, you know? Um, whereas now as things become more common, the cost is a little more effective. Um, and also because of the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, a lot of schools have to have these things now. Yeah. You have to. Uh, 
like how, how they modify, you know, most buildings have ramps now, you know, or mm -hmm. elevators. You have to have that. Um, because if not, then there's a lot of legal issues that can occur. Um, so that's also part of it. That's why things became more common too, because you have to have them now. Um, like most universities will have a disability services area, and they'll have some type of adaptive technology, uh, large print or, or speech software or some embossers sometimes. Uh, but the pushback comes more from the individual instructor. Mm -hmm. Because you might have some old fogey that won't know, you know, anything about people with disabilities, or he'll feel like, oh, I don't want this person in my class because I have to do so much extra work, you know? So they may not always want to meet you halfway until you present to them with like, I have these accommodations that this office can provide, uh, disability services can, can provide for you, you know? You don't have to do much. <laughs> you can email me the documents and that's really it. That's all you really have to do to text, or get your TA to do it. Sometimes they'll make the TAs do stuff, you know? Um, so it, it's, it came more from the individual, the individual more than the actual school as a whole. Mm -hmm. Which, with that, like I said, you, prevent, you, you present them with information. Uh, and then if they still push back, you get the office involved, disability services office involved, and they help you. They help you um, stand your ground, they show them documents, they, they, explain, they ex explain my rights as a student, you know, accommodations that I can have, you know. Uh, so it's a lot of things like that that uh, have occurred over time just to help us along the way. Uh, there's always advocates around, there's, always, there's organizations like the National Federation of the Blind, uh, American Council of the Blind, they will also step in if they have to, to help you, advocate for you. Um, so that's a good service around. They'll do a lot of things. They put on a lot, a lot of events around town, a lot of different organization meetings and whatnot uh, for people to attend, find people to attend, to be a part of a community, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the, a lot of the, whole, th the whole thing about being uh, blind or with a disability in general is that if you want people to understand that you can do things, you have to do them. Um, if I surrounded myself in my, in my bubble of just only blind people, would that really be very effective? Right. It wouldn't be, because what would people be learning? Oh, he hangs with, with the blind community all the time. There's no branching out. There's no learning from the sighted world, which is a, big, a really big, important thing. Uh, because the world is a very sighted place. Most people in the world, the majority of people in the world, are sighted. So I'm not saying it to be like the sign of people per se, but the best thing to do is to try to blend in as much as possible. Uh, now, sadly, people in a wheelchair, like there are people with disabilities that are very pronounced per se. Uh, sorry, you're a target. People are gonna look at you and say, oh, okay, oh, that guy's blah, blah, blah. Can I help you across the street? If they even ask you, sometimes they'll just grab you. <laughs> and they'll try to walk you across, which is very, very scary when someone just walks up and grabs you that you don't know. Uh, that's when, that's when I do my own pushing back. So, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, talked about how once she was trying to cross the street and somebody grabbed her as she was trying to cross and put her in the wrong spot. Yeah. She's totally blind. Yeah. So then she got completely confused, the person left, he thought he was helping, but he really wasn't. He just caused her a big, a lot of anguish and a lot of anxiety. Um, we can cross the street, I promise you. It's something we can do. Uh, we are taught to cross the street by, by following the flow of traffic. So if the street is um, on my left side and I'm going to cross the street, I'm going to follow my parallel traffic. It's going, it's going to go with me. So I'm going to cross the street to the other side, following the traffic. Uh, if the street's on my right, I'm going to cross the street with the traffic still parallel but coming toward me on the right side. So you don't cross when the cars are going in front of you. That's just, that's, you don't cross the perpendicular. Sorry. Frogger doesn't work. <laughs> he will get hit. Um, so there's a lot of uh, strategies like that. You learn how to line yourself up with the street. Uh, you, do you notice that most uh, street crossings, uh, crosswalks, the, the corners are, they have those bumps on the corners? Mm -hmm. Those are called truncated domes. There's different names for them, really, but truncated domes are what I've always heard people call them. That's so you can line yourself up with the street. So you can actually cross the street by yourself. Um, and also, I use uh, a cane, I do, and I do have it here. This is a great thing to help you with. Um, sometimes it's only because, I mean, I didn't always need it per se, but I think so, if I'm walking along and I run into something or somebody, if I run into somebody especially, and they don't, they might think that I just ran into them because I was being, well, 
careless or not careful with it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. You know, so it's a, it's even a good identification tool, of sort to indicate to people he wasn't just being a butt. He really couldn't see you. <laughs> so yeah, um, we can navigate most things. This thing can find most things. This cane can find. Oh, people will call it a walking stick or a stick or all kinds. It's called a cane. I don't care if people call it a stick, really, it's fine, whatever, but it's called a king. It will catch most things that you come in, that you come in contact with, except tree branches. <laughs> Those really hurt. We need to find a way for that. Wear a helmet, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, stairs, it catches stairs pretty well. You want them a certain length. Uh, usually it's kind of like right where your nose is, kind of a little below, a little below your nose. Uh, if they're too short, you will, you know, the cane will catch something, but you won't catch it in time. You'll, you'll hurt yourself. If they're too long, you have no, you have like too much recovery time. So there again, you'll miss what you're coming in contact with. So it's a certain height, kind of where you have the chance to react to whatever you come in contact with. Just the right amount of time. So yeah, I think. Uh, what are what are some of your encounters with people with disabilities? Have you encountered blind people in your lives that you've had to that you? What did you, did you, well, answer that question first. Have you encountered blind people in your lives? Yes. Okay, well, of course you have, Kyle. <laughs> Not terribly frequently. I remember one encounter on Guadalupe, actually, where I was scared for the person because it was such a busy street and such a chaotic intersection, and I was like, oh my gosh, so can they do this? But they couldn't, so. Yeah. It was no big deal. So you let them do their thing? Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? I had a blind neighbor. Okay. How was that like? What was that like for you? I mean, I didn't really interact much with the, with the guy, but every day I would see that they would come and pick him up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you could see that um, people treat him a little bit differently. Yeah. But yeah, every now and then when the people I would help him get to his house, if it was somebody new who never came before, I would help them find his house because the numbering system was weird. Yeah. And. Probably every time they will stop at a different spots. So he wouldn't know where he's going. Know where he could. He didn't have all the same. Yeah, that's very helpful. That's great because I mean that way it's like, hey, you're over here. You know, uh, you might ask if you want help. Would you ask or would you kind of what would you do? Well, I asked. I'm like, yeah. are you guys looking for something? Uh -huh. I asked them, and well, they said, yeah, I'm, I'm looking. For, I mean, I knew my neighbor, but my neighbor didn't know me. I uh -huh. asked, I suppose. Okay. But. As you said, I, I try at least not to indicate without being, you know, right. without being allowed to. Right, right, because it's just like anybody else. If you walk up and just start doing something, no one's going to like that, right? Yeah, you don't like to walk and do something for people and just not ask. Um, and that's great. That's, that's really good. That's, that's really what a lot, of, a lot of things that we want. We want people just to be like, hey, do you need help? And we'll choose to say yes or choose to say no, you know? Or, you know, you might say, hey, you're going to walk along this sidewalk, there's going to be a lot of construction. That's great to know, you know? Uh, nice things like that are very helpful hints. Very helpful things to know. Uh, there's a big curb coming up, there's a drop off. I've fallen off so many curbs, oh my god. <laughs> I have, I mean, part of being blind is taking spills and just appreciating it. <laughs> just deal with it. You're going to fall, you're going to hit something, you're going to like, you know, just deal with it. It's part of life. <laughs> It's just what I have to do. I mean, the scars, the whatever I've gotten in life, I'm like, no, I swear, nobody beats me. I actually fall down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think another thing that people think, people think we're really fragile. Uh, if, if we have taken a spill or run something, like, oh my god, are you okay? Are you hurt? Like, it becomes this big baby thing. And it's like, no, I mean, it's just like if you were to run into, like, well, anything by accident or trip or something. It's just, it's just, we have, I mean, I have, I have the same bone structure as a normal person. I can, I, I'm fine, really. Um, so, anybody else have any encounters with blind people? So sometimes I take the 803 bus uh, mm -hmm. from right outside the uh, school for the blind uh -huh. on 45th and Lamar, and I notice that the bench which they have, which is like a kind of an avant-garde, you know, design, architecture, mm -hmm. whatnot. It is never picked up by the white cane. It is, I mean, the, the pillars are like so enclosed that the white cane never hits it. So 
<laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, it's very aesthetically very nice, but it's like literally designed to, you know, cause people to run into it. Yeah. <laughs> this is right yeah. outside the mm -hmm. school. They kind of overshoot it or they undershoot it mm -hmm. and hit it. Yeah. That, I've seen that. I work at the school with the blind, so I've, I've seen that happen um, to people. And I might even like tap the seat, say, hey, the seat's over here, you know, just to be helpful mm -hmm. as well. See, I, sometimes I do the same dumb things too that people shouldn't do. Because also for me, someone who's totally blind, it's different for me too. I don't know everything either. Uh, even I had to learn to ask, what, what do you need? You good? You know? Uh, and I think working in the field of the, at Tech School of the Blind and other places I've worked, it's, very, uh, it's been very enlightening for me as well. Having other blind friends. Uh, I think one of the best ways to learn is to observe or to ask some questions uh, along the way. It's never really a great thing to ask a slew of questions in one sitting. Uh, people were, people can get really curious really quickly, and they will bright, they, they will they will like throw so many questions at you at once, where it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm not being interrogated, am I? You know. <laughs> now, I mean, it's, if, if I'm like getting interviewed, that's one thing, that's of course. But but when I'm trying to sit down and have a beer somewhere or something like that, I kind of want to have a beer and talk to my friend, or I don't mind answering some questions, but sometimes you know I've got enough work, I'm not really in the mood for it. It's kind of like. You know, it's kind of picking up on social social cues. You know, you guys know people that are really bad with social cues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People that would do just that, right? They would just, you know, they would have no filter, no couth, no. They would just go off on. They they make it about them. Uh, so, like everybody else, I go out. I go to have drinks with my friends. Kyle, you know this all too well. I go to concerts. I watch movies. Um, Let's talk about that for a minute, actually. Movies. This is a good one. Um, so, people will sometimes think, you want to go to a movie? And they'll think, oh no, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> I'm like, why? I can go to a movie. I can sit in the third row or something. I can see it some. But also, the joy of movies now is they have the audio description. If I really wanted it. Have y'all seen uh, Avengers Infinity, Infinity Wars? Yeah. Oh, so you know a lot of stuff is going on in that movie, right? There's a lot going on. I'm like, cool. Um, so, actually for that movie, I, that was the first time I tried the audio description, and I really liked it. It was really helpful because when Thor hit so-and-so and Proxima Midnight did something, I'm like, okay, now I know. If I was watching that, I'd be like, okay, things are happening. <laughs> really, really fast. Somebody screamed in pain. I don't know who that was, but they're dead now. <laughs> so, what do you mean by the audio description? Is it a, like a... That you, you put on headphones, yes. You put on headphones, and there's somebody that has narrated the movie already for you. Uh, it's narrated already. And from what I've gathered, I went to, uh, with a lady to see A Star is Born over the weekend, last, uh, last weekend, and she's totally blind. And I, I didn't use the description, but she did, and I, I could hear hers. And so I, I kind of was listening to her. I was like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, the narrator for that one was really good, too. So, so far, I've, I've not heard any bad narrators. But I wonder if that would be a thing, you know? I, 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 I want to, I guess, try more of those descriptions to see, descriptive videos and see what they're like. So is it something that comes out of your phone or you, you, you check it out from you, the movie? You check it out. Uh, yeah, they give you the set, you know? Do you know if the, the narration is taken from the screenplay? Like, are they just like reading out the, like, the descriptive cues in between dialogue? I actually don't know, that's a good question. Um, now I want to know about that. Um, that's a good question, I never thought about that. But, that would, make some, that would make sense though, I think, you know? Because uh, I guess I imagine how could they watch the whole thing and describe all those details? They'd have to watch it a hundred times probably, <laughs> I would think. So maybe having a screenplay or some kind of script in front of them is probably a good thing. So I would imagine so. But maybe we'll, we'll research that. Somebody will. Kyle, research that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> He's on it. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, so yes, we do go to movies. You don't have to worry about not inviting me to a movie. Um, also, the thing is, people like to use the word. They hate when that. If I say, "Oh, I saw that," they're like, "No, you did," which is funny. No, I mean, it's funny, great, but but sometimes people really mean it, or they might they might hate saying the word "see" around me, or they might think, "Oh, that's offensive to you." I'm sorry, I don't care. <laughs> Dialogue should. I mean, uh, vocabulary shouldn't have to change. Like, basically, it's okay to say the word "blind." It's okay to you know say the word "see." It's okay to say these things. We are not offended by uh, human vocabulary. They're offensive words, but they offend everybody, you know? Yeah. What would offend you, let's say? If it offends me more, people try, try to, to work around it. Just say what you're trying to say. It's like, 
So are you uh, uh, hard of seeing? Are you, um, I noticed that you, um, just say it, dude. <laughs> I'm blind, okay? <laughs> so I find that very refreshing, but is, do you think that that there you're just speaking for yourself? Like, have you found, or do you know blind people who would actually be offended? Yeah. Some, some only because, well, because it's, it's like about people in general, you know? I mean, words will offend people all the time that you wouldn't think offended them, you know? But it's about that person. But a lot of times if they're offended by it, you have to consider that they're probably not really comfortable in their skin yet. They're probably adjusting to their blindness, or they've never adjusted to it, or they've been so sheltered by it, they've never got the chance to really, you know, learn otherwise. Or they're very bitter, you know. So there's a lot of aspect, aspects with that, you know, that go along with it. And that's like about somebody with anything that's, you know, with a disability or that's had tragedy, you know, or anything. They're, they're just somber people in lives that just are like that. So I think that, that could be almost kind of a general thing, I guess, as a whole. Uh, you'll have people like that. One question I have is uh, even the term blind. Uh, I mean, you know, there's kind of, I don't know, verbal inflation or, uh, I mean, essentially, you know, what blind meant 50 years ago might not be the same thing as today. And the reason I say that is uh, I have a friend who worked at a company where they were, they hired a person who went through the interview process, everything turned out okay, and it was completely a verbal interview. And... Uh, after he started working, uh, he said he was legally blind, so they had to get him like a huge, you know, display, Ooh. and he would drive to work, and uh, I, I mean, again, and he was legally blind, so it's like, right. like I mean, that sounds like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the term doesn't mean what it meant 50, 70 years ago. No, it doesn't. It's true, because now, well, also, <coughs> visually impaired is fine. Visually impaired, legally blind, those are fine. Fine turn is great. It's more just don't dance around what it is. That's what I'm saying with that. But but also you're right because uh, and there's so many forms of blindness that have come out. Well, that people have learned about over the years. I'm not saying that they recently came out like a, like a fashion trend, but you know, hey, let's use this kind of blindness today. Great, you know. Uh, there's like glaucoma. There's ret ret retinitis pigmentosa. There's macular degeneration. There's all kinds. Star guards. There's so many. Um, some I can't even pronounce anymore. I just forget. But. So people will see, people that are <clears throat> uh, blind or have uh, visual impairment, it is never the same for, any, for each person. You, I will never find someone that sees what I see. Uh, it's, just, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and I have glaucoma, just so you know, I have glaucoma. Um, I was born totally blind. I was, when I was a baby, about one years old, I had cornea transplants. So I was actually given the ability to have some sight. I have no recollection of being totally blind. No clue of it. I was so little, it just doesn't register to me. Um, my parents would say that I like to find like a lot of, I used a lot of sound cues. I would throw things a lot. Uh, sometimes very expensive things. <laughs> sorry mom, sorry dad. Um, my dad would get so mad. Uh, <clears throat> but that was, that was like, so one of the things that happened, or some of the things that happened when you're a baby, you're learning that sensory, you know, sensory and cognitive and you know the developmental how to develop those motor skills and whatnot and if you don't treat uh, start that early on your child will be uh, that is developed or will be a lot harder to undo what's not been you know what's been done because you've not started in an early time and honestly a lot of the uh, because most developmental things as, as, as uh, in children it's oh it's mostly sight it's mostly based on sight because babies, they see everything, you know? They see and they're curious. The other, the other senses come into play sometimes, but not as much as what they're seeing. So, if you don't engage your child in kind of a, with sound or with some kind of like very tactile, you know, things or, you know, immersion of environment, learning the environment, it's gonna cause some developmental delays, for sure. Was there anything that your parents specifically did to expose you to these other kinds of sensory cues? You know, I think a lot of it was, uh, I always just played with normal children. A lot of it was doing that. Uh, they had a lot of friends that would come over, my parents, did because, uh, and so, and they'd bring their children over and I'd play with them a lot. Uh, we would go to like the zoo, we'd do things around, you know, our city. Uh, they really wanted me to experience a lot of the normal social things people would do. 
Um, well, there was with some limitations, of course. Like, you know, if I was gonna go out on my own, when I was with a child, I was like, go with somebody. Or, yeah. I, remember, I remember this one time, we had this busy street in Germany. Um, I noticed this girl I liked, she lived across that busy street. My mom was like, don't go see Michelle. Don't go see her. If you do, I swear. What did I do? I went and saw Michelle. <laughs> and that was the biggest, okay. That was the time the mom cracked the belt like a ninja. <laughs> I went back to, I went to school the next day, I was like, Michelle's like, did you get home okay? I'm like, I don't like you. Because <laughs> her, her dad had called my house and was like, hey, did you get home okay? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> then I come out like, what's up? She's like, where'd you go? Ah, uh, somewhere. <laughs> Where was that somewhere? Uh, to a friend's house. Was it a girl? Maybe. Was it Sarah? Mm. It was Michelle. Oh, man, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned Sarah. Sarah's my best friend from a... Uh, Germany. We uh, we were both in elementary school together. We flew back on the same plane to Texas uh, in 1992. She now lives in Florida, but she's been my best friend for 30 years now. So, oh, no longer. Oh man, 31. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 30. 30. Never mind. I'll be 37 soon. That's it. Uh, yeah, so that's really cool to have that friend from such a far time ago, too. A long time ago that, that I still talk to almost daily, you know. Um, and even with that, she was a big help too. She was a great help because I always went to her house and we'd go like play in the woods or skateboard. So she was a big, big help back then. Very protective as well, but also would, you know, always hang out with me. And we had a few other friends that would too. So even having friends like that was, was a big, big thing for me, I think. Um, I always felt like people that were, you know, visually impaired or blind that just stayed in the blind circle like I talked about, I talked about earlier, like I said, you don't really experience other things in life, outside of the blind culture. It's really, it's really imperative, I think, to learn your environment, environment and learn from different cultures and different people, different walks. So I had a preliminary question that I should have asked way earlier. Um, and you did. And I did. Go ahead. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, like, I'm, I'm researching vision uh -huh. for my PhD. So, uh -huh. can you... Can you, um, is it possible for you to describe the nature of your vision or its limitation? Like, a, I can do stuff for you, yeah. In what way is it impaired? <laughs> well, let me tell you a little bit about glaucoma first. So glaucoma, uh, glaucoma has, a, it, there's, it affects the optic nerve and whatnot, so you have to take medication for glaucoma, or I guess you could smoke the, you know, the weed, but if you want. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get into it much, I take eye drops. But, so what happens is fluid builds up in your eye uh, and pushes out on the optic nerve which can be very, very painful. Uh, it can cause, there's a thing called glaucoma headaches. They're very painful. They're behind the eye, they really hurt. It's almost like when you have a sinus infection too, oh, that, the, the, you know that feeling kind of behind your eye? Mm. Yeah, it feels like that, so that's a little worse. Um, so that can cause vision decrease, you know, as well, uh, which is pushing down and draining vision away, and other things can happen with glaucoma too. Uh, so, <clears throat> I can see that there are boards, mm. one behind me, a lot of boards in here, man. <laughs> That's cool. I can see now. Oh my god. Uh, the beauty of standing up here in front of you, all you people is that I can't see how scary you actually are very well. I did stand up comedy for it for a couple times, and the lights were so bright. I was like, well, I did it because I couldn't see you. It. It's beautiful. Uh, so uh, I can't see a lot of fine, uh, minute details in people. Like I can see that you know, Stefan has a hat on. Uh, Neil's brown, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course you always say it, so you know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, but but you can you can you can count like people. Anyway. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Sometimes it, probably in the further back would be a little harder, but you know. Nice. Um, like, let's see, anything on this? There's not. Okay. Well, for example, like a regular print, I cannot be regular, regular print very well at all. I have to kind of make stuff larger, bigger font for me, you know. Um, reading is probably the hardest thing for me. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, I can see the door just fine, see all the lights, see and the shit. To the extent that you can see things, can you also see their color? Colors are fine too. But for the most part, colors are okay. Um, of course, there's the common ones like navy blue and black. Those are harder. Got to be closer to that. But uh, who doesn't? You know? Um, street lights are fine. Most colors are fine. It's more just the details. Like if I'm looking at a painting, I won't see all the details in it. Uh, it's, you know, someone will have to describe it or something like that. Uh, so that's, that's what's kind of missed along the way, or details like that. Uh, if, I, if, I see, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody wearing a red hat that they always wear, I'm going to be like, oh, that's so-and-so. 
it's all over the yeah, you know. Um, and do you have any depth uh, sensation? Oh, okay. depth perception? Yeah. That's why I bust. That's why I fall sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's a good question. So, my favorite days in the world are overcast days. They are very, very helpful, and because the sun produces so many shadows, that it can be hard on you know curbs or if there's trees hanging over or steps. Like it can be. I just kind of take my time and kind of measure a little bit sometimes. Whereas overcast, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, distort so much. Um, also, it's easier on the eyes. It's just not as bright. Is it the same in just dawn or dusk? It just gets easier. Yeah, dusk. Was, yeah, dawn. Yeah, dawn and dusk are easier too. They're not so hard either. Um, those aren't so bad. Nighttime isn't that bad all the time. Nighttime can be okay too. Um, when it rains though at night, and it's I'm walking outside at night and it's raining, or it's after it's rained, that can be challenging too, because therefore like all the all the lights will just be distorted, you know, uh, in in the street. So that can be hard. Um, things of that nature when it comes to the vision. Uh, certain color tones like the sunglasses help um, as well. I believe it's amber that helps with contrast. So it brings things, you know, more details out a little bit for you. So I forget what the other chance to do per se, but I can't remember. Um, people think that we have heightened senses. Let's let's please let's touch on this for a minute. We're not mutants. <laughs> as much as I would like to be an X Men or something like that, I think I'm pretty cool at all, but I'm just not that cool. You know? <laughs> um, people think that you know we have these, these heightened senses, and really, what if you think about it? So your, your body, your brain is, is sending signals to, to work with all five senses, right? If you have all five senses, correct? Or so you would think. So let's say if you have a sense that is damaged or non-existent, you know, uh, your brain has the ability to disperse, you're able to, dis to disperse more, you know, more information to the other four senses that are working better. Your brain's gonna automatically do that for you. So you, you're more focused. It's nothing that's heightened, you're just more focused. So like I, like people say, I, I have pretty decent hearing, but it's because I'm able to like really pay more attention to it and devote more energy to it. Um, smells, I might smell things more apparent just because I'm able to well there again, put more energy into it. Um, so I'm, I'm glad. I, I hope I can dispel that because uh, people say that he has heightened senses. I really that's probably one thing I really don't like <laughs> is that it just I, I don't always call people on it per se. I might say no. I might say what I just told you, explain what I just told you about the senses. I won't get mad about it, I'll just be like, okay, whatever, I'll just fix this real quick. <laughs> you have to do a lot of fixing and making it people understand, um, things like that. It, uh, it's just a matter of just using what you have. <laughs> That's all there is to it. But I imagine that, um, so, I mean, physically speaking, all your other senses have the same hardware, yeah. or the same quality of hardware as the rest of us. But when it comes to sensing things, it's not simply the sense organs, it's the whole, uh, whole channel from the sense organs all the way up to your mental representation of it. Well, and if you are paying a lot of attention as these senses are developing, mm -hmm. then don't you think that over a long period of time, let's say over developmental years, after, after a while, the rest of your brain hardware could uh, develop in such a way as to be more um, sensitive. Um, and, and if you ask a normal person who hasn't had to develop those senses quite as much, that if they simply pay attention, they will not be able to reach that same level of performance. They probably could. Um, because, I mean, but sensitive is different from heightened, though. That's still different. But, um, because people will, will always try to work on other senses. Some people just have really great hearing as it is. I mean, this is, you know, because I think, I, think, I think everybody has a deficiency in some, some area of sense. Probably, most, I mean, most likely, most people do have some kind of thing that's lessened, sense that's a little lessened, even a small capacity, you know? Um, so I think you could still develop those senses the same way, all five. It's just a matter of like, you gotta probably put a little more effort into it or, or maybe even close some of your senses off sometimes, you know? People will always say, oh, I try to just, you know, do things blind, it's, it's interesting, you know, or you try to do things without hearing or meditation or, you know, a lot of things that require, like, hearing just the noise around you, and all that's all you hear. You can get into your own head and do that, you know? Certainly. I know that uh, some, uh, like, movie directors and others, you know, they sometimes do these things, like I was watching an interview of, uh, 
uh, Martin Scorsese, and he says he sometimes just turns off the sound and just watches the, you know, because, you know, I mean, there's a huge amount of meaning being conveyed just by the images. Right. Especially if it's a great director like Kubrick and like, you know, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, all kinds of, you know, you can shut one sense off, mm -hmm. use the other, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because also you have to remember that throughout your day, well, so I'm sitting here right now, I'm not using my sense of smell. I don't, I didn't even, well, now I am, but I didn't think about it for a second. Dang. <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> but I'm not using that. So right now I'm using my sense, you know, of, uh, I'm touching things, tactile, you know, or I'm devoting my hearing toward you. So that's more of the senses that are being utilized right now, more so. The others can kind of take a back seat for a minute. Um, so you, in, in this talk already you have uh, contrasted in multiple ways your scene from the scene of other people. Uh -huh. uh, have you seen uh, contrast in your other senses? Like for example, uh, have you been told or have you noticed already how your hearing is uh, different from other people's hearing because you're having to, uh, having you're being forced to pay more attention. Like, are, are people ever surprised? Like, oh, you could hear that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, I never really thought about it much because I suppose it's. I always just kind of hear what I can hear. I guess you know, mm -hmm. and this is like. You would hear what you're hearing, uh, but yeah, I mean, there'll be things that I miss too. I'm like, wow, I didn't hear that, you know. But I mean, I just take it as just, well, I'm getting old too, so that's <laughs> happening also. But I don't know. I guess I just never really thought of that. It's kind of a. This goes along with there again, you know. I guess because I noticed that the one sense that is not as strong, that's more my thing that I'm looking at because it's like, okay, well, it's more what I have to pay. I guess what I what I'm what I'm resigned to deal with, you know. The rest of them, I'm just glad they work. <laughs> Pretty much. So yeah, it, it's um, it's it's uh, there's been points, there's of course been struggles in life with you know. Now okay, I I, I can say this. Okay, I can go into a room sometimes, and this might get to your point a little bit. Let's say that it's really really just noisy, like it's, it's just so much feedback or so much going on. It's gonna be a little harder for me sometimes. Uh, because I'm already using the eyesight that I have sometimes, or I'm trying to use the cues around me, other things around me, and if there's just like a bunch of just noise pollution, I can't always do that. Uh, I can't. I, I have to. I can't really hear the things around me to, to navigate. Sometimes you know, if you're hearing what's going on, that's kind of what helps you get around. Is it just difficult to pinpoint in this situation, or are you talking about like sensory overload? Both. Okay. Both. It can definitely cause overload for sure. Uh, somebody who talks a lot sometimes, I'm like. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I do. My head, <laughs> but it's not because it's just like not even because it's just sensory overload. Mm. It's like man, so that can happen as well too. So when you are going into a noisy, noisy place, that sense of hearing is it's it's a little too much. It's not it's not being effective anymore. It's weird, but I'm like, wow, that does happen, I guess. <laughs> like, if I go to nightclubs, I hate nightclubs. I, I like bars and stuff, but I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the boom, 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 boom places, you know? Um, once I learn my way around, I'm okay, but I mean, it takes a little bit at first, you know? I can learn my way around anywhere at some point, but in a new place, I'm gonna take a little time. Because, uh, like, for example, if I'm going to go to someone's house, my, okay, my neighbor lives down the street, up, up down the street from me, about a few blocks. You know, at first, you know, he would drive to his house, or you know, the first couple times, then I'd be like, oh, we're gonna turn down this street or whatever, or a few blocks, or count the blocks. Now I can walk to Joe's house all the time. He hates that. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I can walk and see Joe and Karen any, any time. It's just like because I know I can walk there by myself. I can walk home by myself. You know, I know the route. And I think one of the weirdest things. Uh, one time I was on the bus with a, an old coworker of mine. And he's totally blind, and. For the most part, the route was a straight route. But when it turned, he's like, oh, we just turned on Anderson Lane. I'm like, how do you know that? Like, because he, he did the route so many times that he even knew like, where the turn happened. Um, so we, you talked about the 803 earlier? Right, was, right. Yeah. OK, so you know it's going down south. It's going to turn on 38th Street, right? Yeah. OK, so when it does that, I know what's going on. And it's going to turn on the Guadalupe eventually, so I know that. I wouldn't even have to see to know that. So eventually, you get used to it. 
be becoming a thing of habit. In those cases, do you do you feel like you rely on like an intuitive sense of duration? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it is duration. Sometimes it's just like even like just being like kind of using your your sense of direction too. Uh, Kyle, yeah. when we're in the car, he gives who gives directions. You. <laughs> it's really true. He, does. he can get lost so easily. Yes. All the time. I'm like Kyle. What are you doing? He's like, I'm lost, Jake. <laughs> we'll get there soon. We've been friends for a long time, so I can, I can always pull him out of that and make fun of him. But, but uh, so let me ask you this, Kyle. Actually, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute. What have you learned from me over the years? Uh, the biggest thing I've learned, actually, is how others react okay. to you. Uh, you can, I can actually really determine how long someone has known you based on how they react to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. The ones that are have long, known you the longest, like you do it. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Or, or uh, as others that are newer, even just handing you things like finding your hand, grabbing your hand, and trying to find match. No, you don't. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's it's very interesting to see that dynamic of uh, people's reactions of. And easily being on the spot like that, how used to or not used to they are to a situation it's good that point. they're not used to. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's true. Um, in Steph, and Stephen, I'm not being very long, but even with our friendship so far, you're helpful, but you don't like overly help. You know, right? I try not to. I'm <laughs> surprised how, uh, how just how socially outgoing you are. I mean, if people in this room have a handicap, it might be the social handicap that comes with physics or something. <laughs> but I was definitely surprised just how I mean you just you just go out and meet people and it's so easy and you're you, I don't know you, you don't do any of that uh, remaining in, in circles that you're saying yeah 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 I just find that I mean I like people sometimes yeah, they're all right <laughs> sometimes I don't but you know that's when I just don't talk to them <laughs> so um, I'm gonna take some more questions if you guys have some. What's that? What, what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's that big thing? Starting job. Patient people. Okay, you know what we're going to do right now? We're going to do a little braille lesson, okay? okay. All right. All right, class. <laughs> okay, so how many people are here right now? Seven. Seven. Seven, okay. Yeah, so I got six of them. There was seven, someone had to leave. You guys still Oh, yeah, there's seven. Hey, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <coughs> Good, because they're all one of these two. Uh -huh. All right, so we have the Braille alphabet. So Braille is comprised of six dots, as I told you before. And um, you can see the positions of these letters. So everything happens in, in this, if you go to the very like kind of central part of the page, right here, you're gonna see all six dots together. You feel that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so all, so each, each that's called a Braille cell. So each letter or symbol, whatever you're gonna do, is is within a braille cell. So you make a letter A, you do a new cell, letter B, that's how you do it. It's all comprised of the six dots. So uh, braille was created by a guy named Louis Braille in the 1800s. Um, he took it from like kind of a <coughs> kind of system of uh, kind of a system that um, I think somebody in the army had something like that, a dot system that people could use to talk, communicate at night. Uh, he went to, well, he went blind at the age of three. He was working in his father's leather shop and he stabbed himself in the eye by accident. And the infection went to the other eye too. And so he went to a special university. He tried to get books for students, or help, you know, to get books for students and whatnot. And a lot of the university heads didn't like that. They didn't like the students to really, I guess, be very knowledgeable, to rise up from what, you know, the parameters of the university itself. They kind of thought all white people just kind of should be kind of stuck in that mode, like with the learned at the university, where he had people that were, uh, he had a supporter that was really big into him, uh, educating other <clears throat> other black people within the system. Um, 
So he worked with you know Braille and created it as in a system that we know today. We did not have W uh, at first. Braille didn't, there was no W in Braille. Braille is a French it was uh, it's a French thing, and in French in French they didn't have a W. I guess I don't know much about French, so I'm sorry. <laughs> if someone does, great. Is there a W in French? I don't know. I took French for like four years. I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> I'm I don't feel so bad retain. now. I did not retain. I feel okay now. Great. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> but uh, so the Braille came along later for other, you know, other countries and whatnot. I'm sorry, the W did. I'm sorry. And uh, so, yeah, uh, there's ways to write Braille. There's things called this thing called a slate and stylus. I didn't bring one, but it's kind of like if you're making a little note, you can like take like a uh, an index card, and you can. It's kind of a, it's a little grid that you attach to your piece of paper, and you're you're basically writing on one side, and it comes out on the other. Um, so that was like a quick way, a short, a fast way writing quick notes to people. Very portable system. Then there's this guy here. This is the Perkins Braille. This is what I used to carry on as a kid. I carried this around from class to class. Hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Uh, so you could braille all your assignments on that, or you braille your notes with that, just before all the laptop stuff would happen, you know. Um, it's a very archaic way of doing it. People still use them, it's still usable. Um, you can still braille notes and braille things to people and braille your labels. It's, it's very common to use this thing still, actually. Um, oh. So, so the, the okay. input levers correspond to one through six. Different dots. Right, yes. Uh, so this guy here is just your, your line calibration key. This is your dot three. Your two, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. This is, ooh, I did it for a second. <laughs> yeah, three, two, and one, and your space bar. Four, five, and six, your graph space key. So if you were to take these dots and close them all together, you would have the six dots. Open the cell up, it lays out like this. So with this guy, I can, like I said, I can do many things with it. Um, I can make labels, I can write notes, I can brawl people's names, whatever. So I'm going to do for you guys, I just silver, I brought cards to brawl your names. Yes. 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 Mm. So when you say backspace, it doesn't erase the character. No, it just kind of puts back. back. Yeah. Okay. Honestly, I don't, I don't really even use it, but I just like take my finger and erase them, you know, scratch out when I messed up. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, just do that. You just brawl over it usually. Um, so yeah, this is the Perkins Brailler. Uh, like I said, now we have Duxbury, of course. We have other things that we use. Um, but now, I'm not gonna say that Braille is phasing out per se, but Braille isn't as common in a book form. It's more like, you know, we have so many things, I was talking to Stefan on the way here about this. We have things like Audible now, and like other digital audio services for people to access, you know. We have YouTube that has audio books too, you know. Um, all those things. So Braille's not, really pays out per se, but it's it's definitely more of a functional thing, I think, I feel like these days. Uh, like I said, labeling things, or it's on your bathrooms, it's on your ATMs, or it's on things like that. Uh, but signs, bus stops. Uh, so, yeah. By the way, I just remembered something cool that I've forgotten. Uh, it was like a Frenchman with the last name Braille that made this, right? Yeah. The script. When I was in France in, uh, during my undergrad, I was visiting a friend and he was just showing me around the city in Paris. And then he suddenly said, oh, you want to see the underground crypts? I'm like, what? He said, okay, so he used this church and he took me inside the church and we went down. He said, it was just this underground world of crypts where people had been buried and one of the entrances is through this church, but there are other entrances to other churches as well. And one of those scripts was like one of those was the tomb of uh, this guy, Braille. Oh, that's okay. cool. It's really neat. It's under the city of Paris. Oh, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, sadly he didn't live very long. He was only 35, I think, when he died. Yeah, he died of tuberculosis. I have a very, I guess, odd question or very specific. But uh, so with Braille, how? I guess it depends on the material, but like. Imagine you had like a well-read book you just read over and over. How much would the constant touching with oils and things on your hands, the constant moving over, you know, you can polish things down pretty well. How sturdy is before 
things start losing their translation? Uh, it can take a while, but it definitely does happen because the Braille eventually, if you, well, also we're we teach people when they read Braille to not push so hard. It's not a matter of like pushing hard, it's a matter of just like just taking your fingertips and it's kind of your fingertip and going along, you know? Uh, some people with Braille can't, some people with uh, diabetes or nerve damage can't do it though because mm -hmm. there's a lot of diabetes that's called nerve damage. So in neuropathy, they call it, uh, they, have a hard, they have a hard time reading Braille. They might be able to read it very little. So they will, sometimes they'll try to push too hard and they'll wear, they'll wear the DOS down pretty easily, pretty quickly. But normal wear and tear, it'll take a little while, but on, on the standard Braille paper, there's a paper called Thermoform, which is more like a slick type paper. It's more expensive though, so you don't see it as often. It's more slick and the dots are more pronounced and they last much longer on that. Um, but this kind of material, this is actually kind of thinner than Braille paper itself too, but it still works for what I'm gonna do. But even this kind of material here, uh, yeah, the Braille would eventually, if you pushed too much, it would wear down. Do you have any blind friends who play guitar, and do they comment about it being harder to read Braille because they have calluses? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <Just Yes. laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question, though. Uh, it's true, because uh, when I play my bass, I usually use a pick. I typically do. Um, or I don't, I don't, you know, because I don't want to get too many calluses. Cause, yeah. It, but, you know, of course, they come off eventually. But, um, no, that is a thing sometimes. People do mention that. I have a lot of blind musician friends that do stuff like that, and they'll use picks or they'll play other instruments that don't require so much of, you know, like saxophones or you know, pretty talented guys I know. But yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes it does happen. Um, I was in a band. I was in a band a long time ago in college called the Food Stamps. It was fun. <laughs> I'm a rock band. I did play bass in that band. I did some vocals. It was fun. So I mean, I mean, I've even done that kind of stuff. So. Um, You're not making things any easier for people trying to hand money to you. <laughs> we would call ourselves the food stamps. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was college days, so we were broke. <laughs> I wish, you know, things, times were hard back then. <laughs> it's the punk rock way to go, you know? <laughs> So, yeah. So I'm assuming, bro, there's always a standard, like, field that these six dots are playing with, right? There's not. All right, or is there a variation of spacing? Because but just looking at this course, looking at sight, not feel, I could see mentally, I would think that a, a, a comma and a capital sign, I, don't, I wouldn't know if I would be able to tell the difference between those three because they're all just one dot. Right. the spacing's different. Yes, because even like, you know, so if they were lying they were right next to each other, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd be able to tell. Okay. Um, so you'd use the other letters to kind of set yeah. the field. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or like, you know, or if you were to, just to like do an A, you'd know it's an A because it's, it stands at the top and you can just kind of, you can always measure with the other letters if you want. Even if there's a space in between, you can still do it. Uh, and when, when you get your stuff here in a minute, you can kind of even look at that a little bit too. Like, look at the words at the bottom. Mm -hmm. See how they're kind of spaced? They're, they're pretty close together. Yeah. But you can see there's spaces in between, you know, like a normal space for the, uh, for the next word. It's kind of like that too. You would eventually be able to kind of figure it out. And so does, for the number sign, do all of the characters that come after that, that aren't separated by a space, are they interpreted as numbers? Yes, so uh, what happens with that, so you put a number sign, and you, you, know, you don't space, you just go to the next cell, as you, as you would, and it's the, it's the letters A through J, they make the numbers. Okay. Yep, so that's how you're indicating it. Uh, it's like the capital sign indicates the capital word, you know, but the next letter always goes next to it, right next to it, in this case. Trippy, huh? Cool. Yeah. How? It says you can use it to write math and science and computer notations. Mm -hmm. I shudder to think of trying to use this to write like a long equation with gross. Like, oh, so. yeah. Oh. That would be crazy. They would, you know, there's stuff like that. I mean, like, and there's a thing called name of code, which is more like math based, usually typically like a math based type way of writing Braille. Okay. Um, I don't know name of code the best. I know some of it, but I don't do a lot of math, so. Um, I was never, it was never my strong suit, sadly. <laughs> Geometry was hard. I think that was my hardest subject. <laughs> Graphs are hard sometimes. It's, it's so visual to me, but some people were good at it. But I don't know. Yeah, those textbooks must have been huge. Yeah, they were. <laughs> um, usually, the, uh, yeah, it, it, it's pretty huge. Usually, like a lot of the homework, or the work at uh, our school is done in class. So it's nice. They don't carry a lot of books around so much like that. The teacher will have a set, like several sets in the classroom for books, which is really nice. So. I'm a long way with it. So I heard something interesting lately. This is one of the new 
ways in which they are trying to break new ground with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which is to give this um, artificial intelligence any picture on the internet, and it's going to tell you what, uh, describe the picture to you. Mm -hmm. Like it's a man riding a horse through um, a, a forest in the fog. So yeah, and this is for like visually impaired people. Uh, anytime they encounter any uh, like. Um, image or video on the internet, this, right. this thing can just tell you what it is. Because there are some things like that, some cameras like that, or things that will do that for you. Um, mm -hmm. Now with that, it, it's, it's a work in progress still, because some things will catch things very well, some things won't. Um, and, and it's still a newer thing, so as time goes on, of course it will be more, it'll be more solid, but mm -hmm. for now there's still a lot of gaps in that. But yeah. there, it's helpful in some ways for sure. Yeah. Like there's color identifiers, you know, and like, sometimes they'll say the weirdest things. They'll like pick up any kind of weird speck of weird color. And, Magenta. No, <laughs> we're in black. Sorry. <laughs> no. So things like that will happen too. Uh, there's even things like a. There's just little labels you can buy. It's, it's called a pin friend. There's just little labels you can buy. You can put like you can put, you can push this pin on these labels and record into the label. So like let's say if I'm gonna make um, spaghetti, you know, I could record boil water, add spaghetti noodles. Um, drain, you know, add ground beef to a saucepan, you know, that kind of stuff. I could do all that, and I could even like put it on, you know, that's like, I can put it like on the box of spaghetti, or I can put it somewhere where I can always access it. So you can do like a lot of cool things with it, with these little gadgets, like cameras and uh, audio gadgets and whatnot. There's so many things coming out now that you can do, that you can use. Um, so in my, my teaching world, I'm a teacher assistant at the School for the Blind. I like it a lot. It's great. But a lot of my lessons are planned. My, actually, my students that I have don't even, they actually don't read breath. The, the ones that I have, they don't. So, but they use so many different gadgets like iPads and uh, iPhones and, uh, of course, voice recorders and activation and large print and stuff like that. So sometimes, sometimes planning lessons can be a little different. I'll plan on, you know, with you know, my computer and whatnot, and just, or with the teacher I'm working with, and we just, we make it happen that way. We put like budgeting lessons or, we show them the money holding system, you know, it's kind of cool if they need it. Um, so wait, why, why don't they read real? Is it because they're just a new generation that doesn't need to learn? No, I mean, they just don't. Um, kind of going the way of cursive, sounds like. Yeah, well, cursive, you know, cursive has sadly not been talking more. They just don't. Um, well, because they came to us from a different level, too. Like, so the students came to us, uh, they went to public schools first. Some of them did. The ones that I have did. They came to us uh, in a program that's called Exit. So what that is, uh, it's a program that, um, it's a transition program of sorts. The students have finished their academic stuff, the, the 12th grades, you know, and they are coming to us for a year or two years to learn skills like uh, employment skills or, you know, job you know, readiness or college readiness skills, independent living skills, things like that. So, you know, if they want to learn functional braille, sure. Uh, a couple of our students, you know, in, in the building do use a Braille course, but or they want to learn it, so they, it's it, they get a choice in the matter, with that, you know, or if we see that there's a need, or like maybe like they could benefit because maybe they're losing vision or something, um, from uh, retinitis pigmentosa, we they, we would work more on their technology, or maybe if they could use Braille as a system, we would teach them. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of where that goes with that. So our students are a little older than I have. And then they go. Then they can go into college, or they can go work. Whatever. We try to find some job placement areas too, within the community. And I work as a job coach sometimes. I go with them. It's pretty cool. So on job sites, this is interesting. On job sites, what we do is we meet with the employer, and we try to make sure that the student has the accommodations needed on the, on the job to do the job. Per se, like if I need to help them show, like like I had a student last year that got a job as a men's clothing store at uh, Joseph A Bank. That's what's called. I think it's called that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it's a nice store. And so I would go with him and I would show, you know, they would show him the system of like how to fold the shirts. I would observe, I was like, okay, do this for me. Show me what you learned. He, sometimes he, sometimes he couldn't do it. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna show you what they showed me. You know, hand on whatever I need to, or a lot of like kind of repeating stuff or hands on, like hand over hand kind of thing. Or mm -hmm. eventually you do like, you know, you do that for a while and you do like what's called structured discovery. You teach the lesson, you step off as much as possible and you eventually the student can eventually do the lesson on their own. What wide range of various jobs would you say 
or picked up? Uh, okay, so one student likes cars. He worked at a car wash. One student likes, he works at a ba uh, place called Tiny Pies. He helps, he helps make the pies. Uh, one student worked at the Halloween store that's around. He did like customer service or he helped like stock things, you know. Uh, the student that worked at the clothing store, he would stock things, he'd greet customers. I think he did everything except for sales. But he would like, you know, refer people to the sales person, you know. But he would, he would also like people around and like show them like, oh, we have this, this might go good with this. He was able to actually like, show people what would go good with stuff. Which is pretty cool, yeah. Um, we had some students that worked like a, a pizza place or, so uh, with animals, like Humane Society, people do that. Um, even in schools, like maybe clerical stuff to start with. Now we had students that would even like, you know, full on eventually become teachers or teacher's assistants or, you know, higher up positions or work for human services or something like that. So. Is there like a program where these companies are searching out and saying, hey, come and apply? Or these are all, hey, I applied for this, they're interested, but now I need help to get adjusted. A lot of times we'll, we'll, we'll find places in the community. Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of searching ourselves. And uh, especially kind of near, near the school, we can do that. And so we'll call places and like kind of say, you know, hey, we got the student that would be really beneficial, you know, be, be benefit from your working with you. This is what he would be, you know, he would have us accompanying him or something like that for, in the beginning until we learn, you know, we would help him train, that kind of thing. A lot of networking on our parts. Sometimes, you know, people in the community will step up and say, hey, why don't you guys do this? Why don't you uh, send him here or something like that? It would be cool, you know. Sometimes people are very receptive and they will, they'll help out. But a lot of it, you know, like I said before, is that fear of the unknown. How much is the employer enough to do? Uh, how much is it? Is it a liability? You know, liability is a big thing too with companies. Um, because if a student gets hurt, you know, on the job site, the company thinks, oh, well, we're responsible. We really, it'd, it'd be us. We would take care of it because we we brought them there. You know, uh, they're covered under school insurance. So. Um, that's how we dispel a lot of those rumors too, or there are issues, not rumors, say issues that people have. Like we try to show them, oh, our student can do this, which is certain, you know, tools. Um, I'll tell you a weird thing for myself. When I finished grad school, I got my master's in adult education. I've always liked working with adults or older people, and I started working teaching ESL classes. Oh, <laughs> the lady called and said, "Hey, do you want to teach ESL classes?" I'm like. <laughs> I don't know other languages, and literally I didn't know much about ESL at all. She's like, well, it's not that. You speak English. You speak English the whole time. I'm like, what do I do? You'll be fine. Through to the wolves, man. I do so many, so many chalkboard lessons and like print out handouts for people. And the hardest thing with doing ESL is students want you to read things that they're, that they're writing. But the nice thing is I'm saying, I'll have to say, read this to me. What did you write? Read it to me. And they would do it. Uh, it helps them learn that I have my limitations, but also I'm learning their limitations too, but I'm still getting what they're doing. So that's a way of teaching for me too. Um, it's a lot of them helping me out. Uh, and that's my accommodation, that's how I've accommodated for myself. I have learned that in using them as what ways, you know, I can help them learn by them helping me know what they have going on. Um, and then there was a curriculum called Ventures that was a really strong, uh, it's usually it's in book form, but they have an online version too of it. So I would always print handouts from that. I'd go over them before so I knew what was going on. And there again, I'd have them read stuff to me. Um, but also in the ESL classes, I found the, the thing to, look, to do a lot was to have them do a lot of role playing or a lot of co -op, uh, collaborative work, cooperative learning. Uh, therefore, I can hear a lot of what they're doing. Or if I write something on the board, they can model. I can model what I want them to do. They can say things along so I know they're saying things right. It's, it, it works out pretty well. Uh, it was very hard at first. I didn't know what to do at first. <laughs> um, I, I teach ESL sometimes still uh, for ACC. Uh, sometimes on occasion, some evenings, but not full time anymore. But that was certainly a challenge. That was certainly a job that I really had to learn a lot of myself. It's like. What can I do? Can I do this job? There were days where I almost said, no, I can't do this. One question, excuse me, which comes to mind, you know, uh, following up on that, uh, and you mentioned you once used to live in Germany. I'm just curious, are there 
differences, uh, which there must be between, you know, how people are, you know, accommodated or treated or what are people's satisfaction level with, like, you know, the support the government is providing in, say, Germany versus France versus U.S. versus Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think back then, like, I felt like it was weirder in Germany. Um, I think they were still learning a lot, too, about what to do, you know, about how to accommodate people with disabilities and whatnot. Like, I remember, as a kid, I had a cane, but there was this big, like, yellow and black armband that I had, that I was supposed to wear. I never wore that thing. It looks so... <laughs> it's like a moving target. I'm like, really? You know? <laughs> and that's, that's kind of where it's, like, the demeaning part comes in. They didn't always know how to, like, not make it so demeaning, I think. So, um... But I think over time, you know, they, a lot of countries have, have since more developed and had better laws put in place too to help. Mm -hmm. um, strangely enough, you know, we as the U.S. are actually pretty supportive, pretty great about people with disabilities. Um, we have a lot of accommodations out there for them, people with disabilities. Where other countries are still kind of learning, or they have things in place, but I mean, it's probably harder to access them. But they have like, a lot of like free health insurance though in other countries, which is great because like if you need surgery for your disability, you can get that stuff in other countries, uh, more like especially European countries, you know. Um, but they're also more ahead of us as far as research goes, I think. Yeah. So there's there's I guess there's certain aspects of where they're ahead and where they're not, per se. So without further, you know, if you have any more questions, please ask. If not, I am done. Hey. Mm -hmm. So one last question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, during past you know the school on forty fifth, you know, for her decades, and I always wondered, yeah, what's there? So do they give tours or something? <laughs> uh, they can sometimes. Yeah. They can give tours. Um, like, or, or even like people will do like their practicums there from other schools, like universities and stuff like that. Like we have a guy now that's doing a student teaching there. Um, or, well, he's he he was observing for the week, but. It's part of his uh, collaborate, uh, his practicum. Um, we had a girl that did all her student teaching at our school, and um, she's finished now, so it's great. But um, sometimes we'll give tours for people. Like I brought friends up there before to look around. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of like how you set it up. Are there um, people who live there also? The students. Okay, so most of the students do live there okay. because they come from all over Texas. We have a few that like that live in Austin, and sometimes they won't. They'll, they'll be day students and they'll live at home. But typically, the, the students will live there. They have dormitories there, um, and so they'll do that throughout the year. They'll go home on weekends sometimes. You know, take buses. We have buses that will charge. Oh yeah, them. those buses look pretty nice. From yeah, the they're kind of nice. They're <laughs> nice, and they'll go to a certain point. Like like there's there's like a Houston bus, you know, that will go. There's like, uh, and the parents have to you know beat them okay. wherever the, the destination is and take them to the town, whatever wherever it is. Interesting. Um, and then sometimes we'll have people that will come speak, like, you know, I had a friend that works for Mutual Mobile, and she came to speak last year. She talked about apps that were, uh, that wanted people that were visually impaired or blind to test them, to see how accessible they were. Uh -huh. So, we, we, you know, we all kinds of things, people that come to the school to either observe it or to contribute something. Interesting. Yeah. How big is it? How many students? Oh, I don't remember now. I think we have more this year than we ever had. I think we do. Um, we have a ton of staff. I didn't know we had so many staff. I'm like, wait, where's this person? Like, who are they? <laughs> when do they work here? <laughs> so, it's a lot of students though. I think it's like 150, 200, something like that. Okay. But a ton more staff. <laughs> Just because I find it interesting, although I already know the answer. Uh, sports. Talk about sports. So, okay, so a lot of students, um, okay, so, you know how last, well, whoever was here last week, uh, Jeff, is it Jeff and Lizzie? Mm -hmm. They talked about uh, goalball, uh, that we, that we, uh, School for the Blind does take part in. Goalball, uh, I'm not sure how it all works per se, but we go on tournaments, and everything like that, all around, all around the U.S. and whatnot. So, there are sports, it's adaptive sports. Uh, Beat ball, like beat soccer, beat, you know, beat baseball. The ball has a beeper in it, mm -hmm. so students can play sports pretty much like you know most sports like anybody else. Most of them, more of the common ones. Uh, I don't know how I don't, I don't, I don't know how like golf or like something like that would work, but I'm scared of golf. I, <laughs> I tried to play golf one time. I, I sucked so bad at it. My friend's like, nope, you can't play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for shutting me down, buddy. <laughs> but uh. 
and then even like with sports, a lot of students will look, will listen to the the, the announcers, you know, talk about, you know, give all the play by plays, and they'll learn that way what's going on in the sport. So a lot of a lot of our students actually do like to listen to sports. You should develop a martial art that's specific to the cane. <laughs> Street fighting. <laughs> and that's a that's a good point too. So there is jujitsu. I'm not sure how how it all works per se, but I have a friend that does jujitsu, takes jujitsu. Uh, he's totally blind, and I'm sure it's a lot of hand over hand, or like you know, of course. But I I, I would think I don't want to fully answer that because I don't know. But yeah, I mean, there's even that. People can do martial arts, and I mean, you know, from the old times of like martial arts, where people would say they had like blind masters, you know that. Would, Conduct, you know, martial arts. So it's they had to learn somehow, you know. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Very cool. That's sports for you. Just don't throw anything at me, please. I can't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not going to be whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, I do find that you're very outgoing and will be willing to try no matter what. Yeah, I'll try. It's, you, it's something you've done the axe throwing thing. We haven't gotten to do that yet. Oh, um, you haven't done that yet? I, I know you want to. I want to. I really want to go to the uh, urban axes. I really want to. And people are always like, "Can we stand back here with you?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a friend, Pete. He has a a, a, bull, uh, a target in his backyard, and he let me shoot a bow and arrow. That was really fun. So people were like, "Wow, that's cool." And, and you know, he would help me line up a little bit. That there's target, you know, and but even he was like, "Wow." That's <laughs> it's like my boyfriend is shooting arrows in my backyard. <laughs> Some got lost in the woods, but he found them. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I like to try different things. I like to, you know, I suck at bowling, but I like to go bowling. I like to shoot pool. Um, now, pool is something more like so. If I have this, if I have a ball, I'm gonna sit kind of like this and let land up. You know, see where the balls actually line you know, up with each other. And do it that way. So that pool is is certainly more of a visual sport, but with what I have, I can still do it. I used to make play bowl, right? Yeah. Yeah. I do okay. Uh, pull shark is a roommate for a while. Yeah, my ex, my ex roommate Sharon, she was a major pull shark. She always, I mean, I beat her sometimes though. <laughs> she used to get so bad. But uh, yeah, so we'd go out a lot and she was a pull shark. So I learned a lot from her too. She, she actually was a very good teacher when we came to pool. Um, so uh, our students like to play air hockey a lot because air hockey is very, you know, there's, there's a lot of sound that goes on. I love air hockey too, it's fun. I really enjoy that sport. It's great. Um, what else have I tried? I tried to drive go karts once. That didn't go so well. Well, you know, so I probably won't do that again right now <laughs> for a while. Um, like I said, I tried golf. I'm not very good at it. There's probably a way, but I don't really care anyway. It's <laughs> golf. <laughs> um, a lot of my people will do swimming. I mean, that's you know, I mean, a lot of the sports that are out there, you can do them. Working out, the same thing, going to the gym, you know, learning. I used to work out with a friend of mine, he was totally blind, he showed me, he was able to show me all the equipment, how it works, I'm like, dude, it's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so that's, a, like, that's like what I even said, how I'm, I learn from people that are totally blind too. Or from people that have other disabilities as well. So said, I don't know, but I'm still learning as a person. We're all human beings, we can't know everything. So, if nothing else, remember that. From this talk, that you're a human being, it's okay to ask. Um, mind people's space, you know, as kind of like it's your own. You wouldn't want to be, you know, pressured too much to talk about things you don't want to talk about. Um, be helpful if you want to. Be kind. You can ask, or just not help at all. Either way, whatever. Sometimes that sometimes that's the best thing too. Just don't help. Um, that sounds cruel, but I mean, if someone's like laying in the road and dying in agony, you know, <laughs> it might be nice to come help, you know, I mean, please. <laughs> but if someone's walking down the street, it's like, oh, there's there, there are no danger there, you know, it's fine. Leave that be. Also, we're not X-Men, <laughs> or Avengers, or any kind of superheroes. Uh, I do joke that I'm the real Matt Murdock, Shadow yeah. Daredevil, I do joke about that. <laughs> that's my Wi-Fi at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some neighbors are like, who's that Matt Murdock person? Like, that's me, you know? So, uh, yeah, those, that's, that's mostly what I have for you. Um, if there are no more questions, we will conclude and I will draw you some names.
Next. Samir. S A M I E. E E R? Two E's? Yep. Okay. S A M E R. All right. Thanks. Of course. Yeah.